Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Doyle. Uh, just a quick question about these outlays. Uh, these are in addition to the $300 million, um, that was approved in AB1. Is Absolutely. That correct? Yes, it's, it. it's approximately $50 million that's on top of what's in uh, AB2X1. Got it. Thank you. I, I have a few other questions, but I want to give uh, the Department of Finance an opportunity to comment. Thank you. Carla Castaneda, Department of Finance. Um, the only thing we have to add is um, also addressing the legislative analyst concern regarding um, the four bed rate model homes and where the, the intent of the language was one, to authorize the establishment of the four bed rate, but also to um, give the state a little more oversight in addressing needs sooner rather than later. We're open to working with legislative staff on how to uh, amend that language appropriately. Thank you. And from the LAO's office. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Earlier this month, our office released a, a report uh, reviewing the department's budget proposals, primarily with a focus on the major policy-driven proposals in the community services program. Our review considers um, the governor's proposals in the context of the recent special session actions. Um, that provides for a significant amount of additional funding, really important uh, reporting and data uh, requirements to uh, help with program operations and allocating those funds, as well as for oversight, and notably, a rate study, um, which would be due to the legislature by March of 2019. Uh, we find that the governor's approach uh, to target funding increases for regional center operations and vendor providers would be complemented by the recent special session actions taken by the legislature. Um, and overall, we find that the governor's budget is really a good start in concept, but many of the fiscal, programmatic, and timing and implementation details still need to be worked out. Our uh, report goes through um, some historical efforts that have been made at looking at financing reform as well as regional center operations and provider rate um, uh, reform. We note that there's been significant momentum in this area, um, highlight how the uh, rate study is critical and funding that um, effort will be important, um, and that meaningful reform in the community services financing um, methodologies is critical to ensuring cost-efficient and effective program operations. And related that to this, we make some recommendations to the legislature should you want to explore those. Um, as it relates to the specific governor's proposals, um, again, we find that they have merit and concept, but uh, raise several questions in our findings and review um, related to those proposals. I will start with the uh, proposal related to the home and community-based services um, efforts to come into compliance with new federal rules that were enacted and finalized in March of 2014. Um, the governor's budget makes a critical step towards compliance on this front, including headquarters support, um, where leadership and um, uh, uh, strong um, programmatic direction will be critical and successful transition. The proposal also includes funding to support 21 programmatic evaluator positions at each of the regional centers. We find no issues with the two headquarters proposals and the um, evaluator positions at this time. However, as the state is still in the beginning stages of evaluating what these new rules really mean for the state programmatically, fiscally, as well as for the providers, um, we are withholding recommendation on the level of funding that is proposed to support transition of provider um, operations that may not be in compliance with these new federal rules. Um, and as it relates to that, would recommend that um, we use budget deliberations to explore the state's progress on this front, um, work group efforts, um, as well as um, needed changes that need to come forward. With regard to the proposal related to the um, new client program coordinators, we find that the special session actions, again, would, would complement these efforts. Um, the governor's proposal would support new program prog evaluators on the level of about 200 um, new um, positions at the regional centers. Um, with regard to this proposal, we find that there are still um, some questions outstanding as it relates to federal funding risk. Um, the state has historically not, or the regional centers have historically not been in compliance with federal rules as it relates to the home and community services waiver um, related to caseload requirements there. Um, this proposal does not target in any way um, uh, spending increases um, 
tied to those particular caseload ratios, and we would let, we recommend exploration as to um, trade-offs, consequences, the benefits of potentially targeting. Additionally, the legislature may wish to explore further what it would take to um, fully fund uh, the statutorily required caseload requirements, including those related to the federal uh, HCBS waiver. Um, with regard to the new uh, residential rate proposal for um, facilities that are serving um, four uh, beds or fewer, uh, we, we offered in our analysis several questions um, related to the implementation of these details. Again, proposal has merit, um, but uh, some of the details as it relates to its implementation, funding, how the, the methodology would actually work still need to be worked out. Um, and appreciate the um, staff comment in your agenda as it relates to questions we had about some of the trailer bill language as it related to um, DDS approval for certain um, changes in service level um, uh, and note that uh, we it may be um, of the interest of the legislature to explore um, how to mech best make that proposal work should it be um, in your interest uh, and that's all we have for these proposals now and should you have questions um, related to the home and community based services rules I know those those are um, also agendized later um, for discussion thank you uh, thank you. I have a few questions about um, these proposals. Uh, I would like to start with the um, the increase uh, in 17 million for 200 uh, client program coordinators, which I see is very needed and warranted, um, given that we've been as a state out of compliance with caseloads. And I can remember having had a very high caseload myself um, as a former uh, uh, service coordinator. I simply wanted to know how will the 200 positions be allocated across the various regional centers in the state? It, that, that issue will work through with the uh, regional centers and their representation through the Association of Regional Center Agencies, ARCA. But um, we, what, we're, what we're planning to do is give regional centers flexibility in how they use these positions. We don't, we're not intending for them to focus all these positions on their uh, waiver caseload uh, consumers. We, we think that it's best for regional centers to look at their caseloads and determine from their perspective what makes more sense because as you're aware, there are regional centers that have forensic caseloads that you know maybe 14, 15 consumers and, and then they've got other caseload levels for um, some waiver eligible consumers that are not, they don't require the same amount of time, so the caseload levels can be much higher. So, our intent is to work with ARCA, the regional centers, and determine how best to make the allocations. I'm sure they're going to be asking, um, given the number of regional centers we have and the number of people served in the state, what's the number? that we would have to have number of service coordinators, additional service coordinators to be in compliance uh, with federal guidelines. Based, based on the last estimates that we did, this uh, covers about a third of it. So we would probably need a, an additional 400, um, approximately 400 service coordinators to get us to that level where we would cover all caseload ratios. And assuming that this 200 is approved, you know, what's the plan and timeline for getting up to full level of compliance going forward? I think we'd be looking at that on a year-by-year -year basis to see what's possible and to see what's needed. I think initially we want to see the impacts that these additional resources coupled with what was approved in the uh, in ABX21, we think that the uh, funding that's available for increasing uh, wages and benefits will help with retention. So I think we want to understand the impacts of those things before we would move forward with any additional proposals. Is, uh, let me ask you about the math. If 17 million, uh, if that allocation secures 200 positions and you need 400 more in addition to the 200, is that the same rate if we just say it's um, it, it's it's approximately you know obviously it depends um, do we just on need another 34 it depends exactly it depends what regional centers pay their employees the 
the uh, impact of uh, the assembly bill will have. Uh, it'll increase uh, wages and benefits for employees, so that will have to be considered as we move forward. But so yes, that's, that's just so it comes as no surprise, and you know I, I try not to do surprises. Every time we have these discussions, I'm going to be asking that same question: mm -hmm. plan and timeline to get to full compliance, because um, 400 million, I'm sorry, 34 million is a lot less than what we lose if we are penalized for being out of compliance, Understand. not to mention what we lose in terms of the loss of potential service, uh, quality of service, because the caseload ratio is so high. Mm -hmm. So I'm just putting it out there sure. that every time that the department comes before this committee, um, uh, I'm going to have that same question and make that same push, that we have a more aggressive timeline towards uh, being in compliance on caseload ratios. Understand. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've got another meeting coming up in just a few weeks. Mm -hmm. so. We'll look forward to the conversation. Uh, I have a few other questions about the, uh, the ARM um, proposed model for bed rate. Mm -hmm. Those dollars, do they pay for, um, is that physical construction, or is that just to create a pot of money that's available to vendor new agencies it, that currently to, don't do that? Yes, to create a rate that, is, that will be payable to um, new, um, new or as providers shift to four bed models, as they, if they move from six down to four, it's just a, a new rate structure to pay those costs. Got it. Uh, I'd like to move on to the minimum wage increase, mm -hmm. and I'm in full support of everything that we can do to provide dollars on the minimum wage increase. We had a very difficult year last year. A lot of our vendors, who I believe also in spirit supported increasing the minimum wage, found themselves hard pressed because if the state's our primary funder for this system, our vendors weren't in a position to, um, you know, pay their employees with the additional wage without more resources. So I'm happy to see that there's an allocation. I want to be clear, one, that these dollars would be available to all of our vendors, and does this cover 100 percent of the costs that our community vendors are going to have to the, the, increase the minimum wage? Yeah, this is an, an estimate that the department developed. Uh, based on the experience we had when the minimum wage moved from eight to nine dollars an hour, um, what uh, what our expectations are is that uh, providers who have individuals who are paid minimum wage will submit requests to the department similar to what we did the last time the minimum wage was increased, and that'll give us an idea of what funding levels we need. But we anticipate this should be sufficient to cover the increase. Very good, and this is an ongoing allocation, so every year the vendors will be able to meet their um, minimum wage requirements. That's correct. And then as inflation, uh, how, how will uh, inflation be factored into the conversation on an ongoing basis? As the state minimum wage is adjusted, we would, uh, we would work through the same process that we have with prior increases. Very good. Uh, Two quick questions uh, about the behavioral health treatment services. I, I note that there is a reduction in funding. I just want to make sure that we are not um, uh, hurting our ability to meet behavioral health needs um, by making uh, a reduction in funding. Is there a trend? Is the downward trend in need of service um, ongoing, or is this just based on one year's reduction? Yeah, th this is based on the um, transition of our consumers uh, to the um, Medi-Cal benefit. So now that Medi-Cal covers uh, behavioral health treatment, we have consumers that are transitioning over and they'll be covered under Medi-Cal. So we've been working closely with DHCS on this issue to ensure that as this transition uh, progresses that individuals retain services and that um, if that there are no um, gaps in services that this is all um, sort of um, transparent to uh, individuals and their families who are receiving the services. Does this mean mental health services? Does this include mental Behavioral health, health treatment includes a variety of services that are related to uh, behavior modifications. Uh, they're typically used uh, for uh, individuals with autism. So in other words, recognizing the transition of those served into a Medi-Cal mm -hmm. program, there's opportunity for savings in this allocation area. Correct. The, the, as, 
as these uh, individuals transition over to Medi-Cal funding, there will be a decrease in our budget. Do we have any indication that they'll need to have an increase to complement just knowing how um, overprescribed Medi-Cal is and that we don't have providers in a lot of areas and that there are access issues? Do we have any evidence that they'll need to be um, a way to supplement and complement even with the Medi-Cal transition? The, um, the funding is available through Medi-Cal and um, as far as how it impacts their total budget, I'm, I don't have those specifics. But This will be a place that I'll want to monitor and to ensure that we don't have people served who can't get access to behavioral programs, to mental health programs, and to right. other things that they have a need in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, ha having worked in the community, I found that this is a huge area. Uh, behavioral uh, programs have been traditionally uh, just not enough programs, not enough program availability. Mm -hmm. And so I want to make sure that while we do have the opportunity to do more through Medi-Cal, that we don't rush to judgment and say we no longer have to provide additional dollars and that we monitor that transition. You know, most transitions I've ever been a part of have had a few bumps along the way. And I want to make sure that we create about a smooth transition as possible for the people that exactly. we serve. Thank you. Final question is about the early start language. And I just want to be clear, mm -hmm. there's a program I'm you know, very interested in and want to make sure that there aren't going to be any impacts to the early start program. Does that mean that now that we have staff who work in regional centers to do the assessments and work with programs yes. that you're just removing old language yes. that spoke to requirements that are now being met by the Early Start program? Yes, that's correct. Very good. Thank you. Um, do we have any public comment on these items? Public comment. Hey, Mr. Thurman, Rick Hodgkins again. Well, I don't know where to start. Happy holidays. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I said happy holidays. You uh, wished happy me holidays. a Merry I'm Christmas sorry. before. Thank happy you. holidays. I, I apologize. Oh, I no. You, you extended a greeting to me, and I didn't yeah. return it. I'm just yeah. returning it. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know where to start and stop, but I will say this. With regards to purchase of service dollars, and, you know, the, client, the service coordinator should just go right to their supervisors and not have to take things through committees. The other thing with regards to mental health services, I would know that uh, I would note that current law mandates that all Medi-Cal patients, whether they are developmentally disabled or not, go through Sacramento County or, or in whatever county they're in. I would note that the county mental health systems are not the best for uh, our population, the DD or IDD population, because. It, the psychiatrist only can deal best with people that just have a psychiatric disability, and that's all. So I, I am a proud patient of UC Davis and UC San Francisco. I would suggest having our uh, population go through the UC medical system for all their behavioral health needs, not the county shrinks. And uh, second, with, and finally, with regards to uh, the new CMMS rules and waiver, uh, I would note that while each person's needs are different, individual and unique, and that includes myself, even though that I live, I get ILS services and I live on my own, when it comes to people in care homes, I would uh, report that uh, the new regulations do require that if a client wants a room, if a client in a care home wants a room to themselves, then he or she should be entitled to that, along with you know access to food whenever they like it, access to you know a key to the house you know access to you know having visitors over any time of the day so let's keep those in mind thank you thank you Thank you. My name is Michelle Hyde, and I'm actually a behavioral service provider. I represent the California Consortium for Behavior Analysis, um, about 40 service agencies that provide behavioral health treatment. So I'd like to, um, you know, first thank you on, on your leadership um, on this issue, representing uh, individuals with developmental and intellectual disabilities. Um, I'd also like to um, rec recognize you for your um, for your recognition of the transition of behavioral services. Um, I think there are going to be bumps in the road for both families and service providers. 
And, um, you know, I appreciate the department definitely working with us, and we've been attending the DHCS um, stakeholder meetings and trying to navigate the transition. Um, but I anticipate that it is going to be challenging for families to move from regional center funding and providers that are currently providing the service, possibly having laps in services or um, transitioning to new providers. And providers are having difficulty um, getting into networks with the Medi-Cal uh, managed care plans. And it's just been a very um, challenging navigation from a service provider's perspective. So um, I appreciate your recognition of the difficulties that we may encounter in that transition, but we'll continue to work with both um, DDS and DHCS as we move through that. Um, I am also a parent of a child um, with autism, so I would also like to speak on um, the difficulty with CSCs. When we don't have enough service coordinators, families don't get callbacks. Um, they have trouble, you know, reaching out to their service coordinator and getting the help that they need. Um, we hear from families who, um, you know, may wait weeks to get a callback. And from a provider's perspective, you know, we have increased coordination time, and we have to reach out, um, you know, time and time again to the service coordinators to get authorizations. It may result in lapse in services because we can't get timely authorizations. And I, you know, I do suppose that it's in large part due to their large caseloads. So I appreciate, um, you know, the request for, for increase in, in coordinators, but as we know, it's not going to really meet the true needs of the consumers and the vendors that um, they're working with. So thank you very much for the time to speak today. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jackie Dillard Foss, and first and foremost, we um, are in a place of gratitude. So thank you, Assemblymember Thurman and DDS, for the work that we actually have hope for July 1st of going forward. I wanted to address the minimum wage issue because I appreciated your questions. Is as we look for this wage and benefits pass through, as minimum wage goes up, compaction happens. And then as minimum wage goes up for that salaried exempt employee, every wage order in the state of California, it's minimum times two. I've been told many, many times I'm making a business choice, although regulations call for a supervisory position. There's no recognition. It's just the minimum wage goes up. That's what we pay. If I'm in supported living, I have an overnight staff that's now making minimum wage to sleep, and then I have an awake staff. So July 1st, wages will go up. I believe we're going to continue to have this minimum wage conversation, and if we don't have the full scope of the conversation, it's going to continue to be a stressor on providers and those receiving services. So I just want us to always be aware of that conversation. So I thank you for that. Thank you. Well, Sanford, with Futures Explored, I would like to support the comments by the LAO related to the transition and the settings thing. $15 million for $2 billion worth of federal dollars that are purchased in the community is probably not enough. Oregon, to transition 1,000 people out of sheltered workshops, is going to spend $15 million. May not be enough dollars to really make a huge impact, but at least it's recognition we're going the right way. And really, we need direction and support for what the settings rule is, which is involvement in activities in the community, not in sheltered or segregated um, facilities, which is not always directly and very clearly done. I support Jackie's comments on the minimum wage, especially the two times minimum wage for exempt staff, having just gotten my final denial um, appeal for that. Thank you. Good morning. Barry Giardini with California Disability Services Association. Um, Mr. Chair, I'd like to thank you again for your leadership on our issues and, and for the subcommittee for keeping the DD community at the forefront of the conversation, as well as uh, thanking DDS for their efforts in, in securing the funding that we just received. Um, I'd like to echo what Jackie and Will both said about the minimum wage is a great question if it's going to capture all costs. I'd also like to point out that all, as California's salary exempt requirements requiring twice as much is already going to be uncovered for our providers. We're also facing federal regulations that potentially could raise the salary exempt level again coming this summer. So it's just another, going to be another hit to providers. Um, there are still, as, as, although we appreciate the funding, there are still going to be gaps uh, that providers aren't going to get costs reimbursed for. Um, so this, we love the conversation. We want to continue having it, and we look forward to uh, addressing more issues in the May revise. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair and staff, uh, Rick Rollins here uh, today on behalf of ARCA, the Association of Regional Center Agencies. We'd like to add our voice uh, in thanks and appreciation to your work, Mr. Chairman, uh, in the special session and also for the work of the administration and our partners in the Lanterman Coalition in uh, bringing, that, uh, bringing that home. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, ARCA strongly supports the closure of the DCs and remains committed uh, to in, uh, meeting individuals' needs in, in the community settings. Uh, ARCA supports the funds in the governor's budget to support 
support service providers and regional centers to develop needed resources to make developmental center closures possible. Uh, ARCA also supports the additional funding for residential facilities uh, serving four or less individuals. This will lead to more customized services for each person. Uh, we know the state must focus its, its attention on the Centers for uh, Medicare and Medicaid C, uh, CMS final regulations and ARCA supports the funds for service providers and regional centers to make current uh, resources more integrated. ARCA supports the $17 million for regional center caseload uh, ratio relief. This will allow regional centers to uh, hire approximately 200 additional service coordinators statewide. We recognize this is a first step and appreciate your comments, Mr. Chairman, on uh, the need to really get to the, uh, the holy grail of, uh, of what we need to meet our commitments to the federal government of uh, close to 600 uh, new service coordinators, but we, ap we appreciate that. And lastly, when you get to this issue, uh, ARCA opposes the proposal to use $42 million in regional center purchase of service funds to pay for D.C. audit exemptions. Any surplus POS funds, uh, we believe, should be reappropriated from the 2015-16 uh, budget to address unmet service needs. Trailer bill language could allow uh, regional centers to use this money to fund program startup and median rate relief to develop necessary services for unserved and underserved individuals. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dwight Hansen, on behalf of the Alliance, proud member of the Lanterman Coalition, I'd like to echo the thanks that you've heard from others, uh, particularly to the, the administration for engaging with us so diligently on this uh, last package and to Mr. Wilkening as a leader of that effort for your leadership. Uh, Mr. Chairman, and for your colleagues, both the Republicans and Democrats in both houses of the legislature, these kind of things don't come together without that kind of a broad-based appeal, and, and we appreciate that very much. Um, as it was said a minute ago, however, you can't repair 20 years' worth of damage in a single budget as significant as this was. There's a lot of holes here, and there still remains programs across the state and, and communities all over the communities all over the state who are at risk to collapse. So as we come forward with you and begin to talk through this budget process, we think it's important to begin to talk about other revenue sources that we might be able to access, emergency uh, funds that might be available to keep some of these programs from collapsing. You absolutely don't want to be in your district the day 200 parents call you and say they can't go to work because their day program went away. So again, we look forward to look, working forward with you on this. We echo the issue on the minimum wage, the two times minimum wage. There's a whole bunch of other requirements that are coming down the road, some of them at the state level and some of them at the local level. If they're not funded, then the hole we just tried to fill in gets dug again by these other costs. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, Carl London, I work with the Alliance, but I wanted to testify today here just as a uh, member of a local agency board and as an individual parent and start by thanking you, uh, you know, major ditto to you guys. This is a remarkable year to have this kind of funding coming to the community. But as was said, we have to be really careful to not over-celebrate the win that we've had today. Uh, there's going to be a lot of community-based programs out there that did not get favored in this proposal. And the fact is, and this is the thing we've got to keep in mind, is that the people who are in those programs today are there as part of their IPP. They got a program sign-off that says this is where they want to be and this is where they are today. And we can't just abandon that. Uh, as Dwight said, you, you know, the, the worst thing that's going to happen is a program closure and we've got to find spots for people. So just as you're doing for the developmental centers in the budget process, and developing a transition for that population. We've got to take the same care to develop transition programs and funding for the community-based programs so that people have the same opportunity to move if that's indeed where we're going to go with these programs. I uh, want to encourage that to be looked at. And I also want to continue to urge you to take a leadership role on the developmental center issue. One of the things that came out of the budget in the last year was the language to have the department report back to you on possible savings over time with the closures of the developmental centers. <laughs> Today, that budget's in the neighborhood of $550 million. I would submit that that's the next place where the next great funding proposal will come from for this community as those close down, because in eight years, you will have gone from spending $550 million to zero. And when we hit that zero point, that money can't just disappear back into the state budget. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, Jamie Davis, Executive Director of Marin Ventures, Assemblymember Thurman. Nice to see you. See you. 
Uh, we're a large program in San Rafael, largish, about 100 clients uh, with um, severe and profound medical needs and transportation needs and communication needs and um, a lot of barriers to community integration, including people who just don't want to go out, and they've made that clear to us. Um, I've been trying to think of a metaphor, you know, like turning the Titanic to create the program changes that we will need to make. And when I think about the $15 million investment across the state of being less than a million dollars per regional center, I need a new van. We have a fleet of six now. One died this year. We used to have seven. $45,000. And that, I mean, I'm sure that Marin is not the only county in the state where there are transportation barriers to participation in the community. So we need to make that pot grow somehow over the next few years because not only do we not know where we're going, I'm not sure we know how we're going to pay to get there. So that's my concern today. Thanks. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair. Uh, Assembly Member Tony Thurman, great to see you again. You too, And sir. thank you. I echo all of the praises that have come your way, uh, either in this group or even outside and in the Twitter world, as you know. And I uh, really appreciate your leadership here, and it came from, uh, from this committee in a, in a big way. So thank you. On behalf of the Lanterman Coalition, I want to say thank you. And it's, a, it's our first chance to do that here publicly. And then you, also sir. the administration who worked so hard with us to work out the details in moving forward. It was a, it was a great first step. As you acknowledged, it was a great first step in the beginning to recover. Now, most people have said all the things I wanted to say, so you're lucky I don't have to keep going. But I do want to at least you're mention. you're going to go anyway. <laughs> but, but since I'm here, and I didn't remember the time limit, um, I do want to uh, associate a couple of things that we've heard already, and I'll be quick. Um, the piece that um, Mr. Hansen had brought up from the Alliance regarding the emergency funding issue, I think it's something we, should, we definitely need to talk about further because it's something that we saw uh, during the during the crisis that we continue to see. So um, I want to associate with that. Also, as uh, uh, the parent that just spoke before me, Mr. London, that talked about the developmental centers and the and the and the, that process there and that closure. We want to work very closely with the administration, as we know we will, but also uh, with you on how that money is uh, put out so that we have good preparations for people moving from the developmental centers into the community and don't lose that commitment from the state already. And uh, the other piece that I wanted to finally uh, also associate with is the, the, um, the mention that the regional centers had brought up about the, that money that was set aside to, to fund um, some, um, um, some, f some penalties for not being in compliance. And, and uh, we've started to really look at that even closer lately. And, and we agree also with the, uh, with the Association of Regional Centers on how that money should be used. And, and uh, we really want to urge, your, urge you to look at that even closer. So thank you. Those are all of the things. Thank you again. Thank you. I feel like I should probably change my shirt and tie and my suits. This is my third time up uh, and my last, guaranteed. So uh, Rick Rollins uh, here uh, now on behalf of the Autism Business Association and the ABC School of Providers of uh, Services to Children and Adults with Autism, uh, ABA Services. Uh, we have uh, approached the department and uh, the governor's office and the Senate and now approaching the assembly to ask that uh, SB 946, which was Senator Steinberg's historic legislation that created the mandate for health plans to pay for ABA services sunsets next year. And there's a great need, of course, to eliminate that sunset permanently. As I have testified before, when we sunset autism, we can un uh, sunset that law. And uh, clearly, it would be a, a great move. Um, there are two bills right now by Mr. Nazarian and, and Senator Mitchell that address this issue. But it seems that since this was such a huge issue when it passed uh, as part of the budget process and the savings to the state, keep in mind, millions and millions of dollars are now being paid for by the health plans for ABA services uh, to children with autism, not only in the regional center system, but all children that are, and adults, there's no uh, uh, age limit on this law and there's no uh, cap benefit on this law. Uh, so many children and, and others who do not qualify for regional center services uh, who ha are on the autism spectrum are taking full advantage of this particular coverage now with uh, private health plans. So we would urge you to consider uh, removing the sunset on uh, SB 946 and doing that through trailer bill language. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, did you want to close with anything, sir? Did you have anything that you wanted to close with? Thank you. Uh, we'll then uh, thank all of our uh, witnesses and staff and uh, move to uh, issue four, uh, serving consumers in the community. Um, we welcome representatives from the department as well as California Disability Senior Community Action Network and um, the Autism Society of Los Angeles and Disability Rights California to come forward.